God, a man did and buried, but still walking around Birmingham. There are several ways to die. Not everybody that's dead is out at the graveyard. Some of them are walking right around Birmingham. There is a thing called spiritual death. It is found in Matthew, the 8th chapter, and verse uh, 22. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, had come through a certain city and was on the way out when a young man caught up with him in verse 19. And in verse 21, another of his disciples said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. In other words, I'll follow you after the funeral. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Now, how can a dead man bury a dead man? There must be two kinds of death. There is physical death, where they take you down to the uh, undertaker and he embalms your body and lays you to rest. And the Bible says that there is spiritual death. That's why you're still walking around here without Christ. Now go with me to <coughs> 1 John, the fifth chapter. Uh, 1 John, chapter 5, and verses 7 and 8. Hold on, if that's what I want. Uh, hmm. That's not it. Well, I'll quote it for you. And somebody tell me where it is. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life. It's in 1 John. And that life is in his son. I'm reading it. What is that? I don't, uh, one person. Verse 11. Mm. Ah, ah, there it is. She had right down there. Had the chapter. Didn't have the verse. But I was reading the verse anyhow, though I wasn't looking at it. You got it? So I'll just keep on reading like I was reading. Look down at verse 11. <clears throat> and this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. And that life is in his Son. Is that what it said? He that hath the Son hath life. Huh? And he that hath not the Son, am I still reading? Hath not life. Now if a man is walking around Birmingham without Christ, he's a living dead man. Isn't that what that says? If he's got Christ, he's got life. If he hath not Christ, he hath not life. And evidently that young man that came running up behind Jesus said, first, let me go bury my dead. He's putting a funeral ahead of the master. Amen. Jesus said, follow me and let those dead folk back there who don't know me bury that dead daddy of yours and you keep coming. That's what that said. So then, there is spiritual death. Uh, back in the Garden of Eden, when the Lord spoke to Adam and Eve, you remember in Genesis, the second chapter, he showed them a tree and told them not to eat of the fruit. And he said, the day that you eat of it, ye shall surely do what? Die. Die. He was not talking about dropping dead. He was not talking about physical death. He was telling them that when you disobey me, 
death begins to set in on you at a level that can threaten your future. Spiritual death. Got that? Dying thou shalt die, the Hebrew says. And it is significant that when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, suddenly they became aware that they were naked. In other words, they had already begun dying. Up until the point that they ate that fruit, they were unaware that they didn't have to wear clothes. Righteousness was a part of their nature. It was built into them. It's not built into us. I'll tell you in a moment how we get it. I wouldn't dare let you walk out of here not knowing how to receive spiritual nature. But the big thought here is that Adam and Eve were created with it. They were made spiritual, physical, and mental beings. But the Lord said, if you bite that apple or that piece of fruit, whatever it was, you're going to die in a very special way. I'm going to strip you of your spirituality. And you're going to run and hide because you are now loaded with guilt. Amen. And you know the rest of the story. The Lord found them over in a clump of bushes, covering up. And men have been covering up their dirt ever since. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Covering up ever since. Now, you and I are born dead. Listen to me carefully. Any child born into the world is born with a body, born with a mind, but no spirituality. Well, how do you know that, Cleveland? Well, here it is. In the book of John, what book did I say? The third chapter, what chapter? Jesus talking to Nicodemus in the third and the fifth verses. And I'm reading. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water, that's baptism, and of the spirit, that's conversion. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, mm -hmm. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. Now a little baby comes here born of his parents. He's not born of the spirit. And he's not born of the water. So he's born dead. In the very sense that Adam and Eve died. They didn't drop dead physically. Their minds were still alert. But spiritually, they were stripped of spirituality. Now, wait a minute. So that. When a poor little baby is born, Jesus said in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Or spiritual, the Greek says. <sighs> a baby born into the world is born of a mama and a daddy. They are born of the flesh. And in order to get what Adam had, you gotta be born again. 
Now that's verse 3. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again. You, you see uh, what mother, uh, mother and daddy gave you all that they could. Flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, to get hold of some spirituality, huh? I gotta be born again. Have you got that one? And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And in the 51st Psalm, David said, In iniquity did my mother conceive me. We are born in sin and shapen in iniquity. And the Lord hit Nicodemus between the eyes with that. And Nick said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time? into his mother's womb and be born. <laughs> Jesus said, how is it that you are an educated man? Finished the big university there, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, huh? and a member of the ministerial alliance. And you don't know what I'm talking about? He said, then I'll break it down for you. And he's got to be born of the water. And he's got to be born of the spirit. Not in that order. For if you're born of the water, you'll go down a dry devil and come up a wet one. Did you hear what I said? The Lord wasn't telling you in which order. He just said you gotta, gotta be born of both. Just like when you came here physically, you had a mama and a daddy. When you come here spiritually, you got the blood and some water. That's right. The Holy Ghost and water. That's your spiritual mama and daddy. Baptism is your daddy. Holy Ghost, your mama. And when you go through both of them, you come out of here with a third nature. You come out of there with Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. You're a walking dead man. That's why you drink liquor till you can't get home. Talk to me. I said talk to me. That's why you got so many girlfriends who ain't got no money when you get home. Talk to me. I said talk to me. That's why you got... That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can tell when a man is alive unto God, he's trying to do right. That's how you know. He's not trying to do wrong. He's trying to do right. Mm -hmm. That didn't mean stop preaching that early. That boy got to singing that, wash my sins away. I could barely stay down there. I felt like jumping up before he got through. Because he, I told him to sing it because I knew that's what I was going to preach about. So the big thing you want to settle now is don't live your life at the physical level. There's another life available to us. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts are <laughs> arise and fears dismay. Walking around dismayed half the time. <laughs> uh, my, my ears have caught 
the joyful sound, the sound of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up. Well, let's take another look at being born of the Spirit. Uh, it simply means that when we invite through prayer the Holy Spirit into our lives, you know what prayer is. Prayer is simply asking God for what we need. Big Begging is asking your husband for what you need. I don't think you heard me. <laughs> Prayer is the kid wearing his mama to death for a bicycle. That's, that's begging. Prayer is talking to the heavenly father. And it's not begging. It may take the form of pleading. It may take the form of insistence. You might get so desperate, Lord, <laughs> I don't want to live another day like I am. Change me. I got news for you. He'll do it. And if you're not serious, don't say it. Because he never hangs up the telephone. So he heard you. And don't let him hear you. He just might change you. Ask and it shall be given. Matthew 7, 7. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. It's dangerous to call on God if you don't mean business. So then there's a thing called spiritual death, and we're all born there because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans, Romans 3, 23. And everybody therefore needs to be born again. Uh, the conversation between Christ and Nicodemus might well have been a conversation between Christ and your own heart and mine. We must be born again. And what that means is that Jehovah performs major surgery through the agency of the Holy Spirit on every man's brain. Because it is in your brain that, that motivation occurs. It is in your brain that ideas are formed. He doesn't, uh, you heard that text in Matthew 5 where the Lord said, if uh, your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Yeah, you read that and wondered what it meant. And if your right hand offends you, cut it off. You read that? Now, he wasn't telling you to go get an ax and chop off your hand or go something and gouge out, gouge out your eye. He was telling you to get rid of uh, uh, the, the, the state of mind. It makes your hand reach for what it cannot have. If he does that, you're safe with a hand. If you ever get converted, your hands won't stray. You, hear what I say? you don't need to go get your eyes gouged out. Get converted. And you can look at a woman and not want to follow her home. You can say, Heidi, sister, shake a hand, talk to her with, without your hand spraying all over her body. Put your hands in your pocket and talk. That goes to you women dealing with men, too. I noticed the men ain't making much noise, so I thought I'd, thought I'd better hit the sisters too. I'd quiet them down a little. All right. So then, how to be born of the Spirit? Well, there's a Bible principle. Confession, re repentance, faith, repentance, confession, conversion. That's all. Faith, I believe in the Lord Jesus. I believe that he can help me. Repentance, oh God, I'm sorry for the life I've lived. Conversion, while I'm saying I'm sorry, the Lord starts straightening out my sorry head. Straightening out my thinking. Clearing up my concepts. Elevating my motivation. I've got new goals. Fresh priorities. 
I don't, I don't just stop going where I used to go. I stop wanting to. See, that's how you know when you're converted. When you don't want to go back down yonder. Now you know where yonder is. So I'm going to be nice and just say, yonder. And wait a minute, you got to go another step forward. When you get converted, you're not sitting at home mad and making your wife miserable because you're not down yonder. That's what conversion does. Gives you another appetite. Makes you run your wife crazy. All right, she starts pleading for some relief. <laughs> Say, go play some basketballs. Something. But you can bet your life she loves it. She's glad to see you acting like you want to be around her. And conversion will give you that state of mind. You won't stay gone all the time. Well, it's a little quiet early, so I think I better move on. Now, now, this is the way to die, though. This is what I, this is what I came to tell you. I came to tell you how every one of us ought to really die. Did you know that before a cob of corn, a cob of corn uh, becomes a cob of corn, they drop the thing in the ground and it dies. That's right. And then it's resurrected. And then it shoots up. And then you fill up. Oh, that's right. That's right. It dies. Now, now that's what we call desirable death. Uh, we've got to eat, so the kernel has got to die and be resurrected. And the miracle of resurrection takes place. Every time a a stalk of corn shoots up out of the ground. Now there's something there for you and for me. Uh, we all must die to get converted. Uh, in Romans, what book did it say? Chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. Let not sin reign in your mortal body that ye should obey the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members, that's the parts of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. In other words, when you get converted, there's a part of you that dies. There's a side of you that's supposed to die. Uh, your appetites, all appetites, die. And you yield your members instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. That phrase, under the law, does not mean under the law's jurisdiction. For Romans chapter 7 and verse 1, right down below there, says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So this does not mean you're not under the law's jurisdiction as long as you're alive. The law of God applies to you. Thou shalt not steal applies to you. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy applies to you. That's what Romans 7, 1 says. So that when it says you're not under the law, but under grace, it means not under the condemnation of the law, not under the jurisdiction of the law. You're never exempted from the jurisdiction of the law until you die. That's what Romans 7, 1 says. But the condemnation of the law, you can get out from under that by observing it. I was passing through a little old Georgia town and I was talking with a preacher and forgot the speed limit. 
And man, when I heard that noise behind me, I pulled over. Cop came up and said, where's the fire? I began to apologize. He pulled out his book, started to write, and I kept on talking, very humbly, because I was wrong. When you're wrong, that's no time to be arrogant. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Hey, yeah, we got some people bad. No matter what they're doing, police come up, start cursing and going on. That's why they're in jail. <laughs> if you are wrong, show some humility. If you, if you are right, there's a, there's a way to tell him, look, uh, we'll meet you in court about that. But, 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 but if you're wrong, you ain't got no mouth. Yes, sir, I was wrong. That man finally put the book up and said, well, preacher, since you're so nice about it, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> well, I'm glad he did, because I was broke. <laughs> Riding along in my big, shiny car with a flat wallet. I said, Shh. He said, but I tell you what, if you keep speeding, I'm going to have somebody pick you up down the road. Man, I crawled out of that town. Speed limit was 35. I was doing 20. See, I mean, I got under the law by breaking the law. Yeah. You got that? But, but the moment I uh, repented of my sin, the man forgave me. And I slid under grace. Are oh, you listening? And I rode on out of town under grace. And that grace made me so conscious of the law that I was going 15 miles under what I could have done. And my wife finally said, well, you're on the highway now. You can do 55. <laughs> I was slow working up to 55. Are you listening to me? When you become a Christian man, you become conscious of the limits that God has placed on your behavior. And, and wait a minute. And the better Christian you are, the further within the limits you live. I, I ain't got much confidence that old Christians are living right on the edge of their privileges. That's like coming through a mountain, riding on the edge of the highway, and there's nothing down yonder but space. And you over there on the edge. I mean, get this car over in the road. That is, if I'm in there, or uh, uh, get out and let me drive. But get away from the edge of that cliff. I'm talking about somebody. I'm talking about some Christian around Christmas time. He ain't gonna drink no liquor, but he's got some there for his friends. Well, you know, my buddies, they still drink, and I've invited them over. And you're supposed to be a Christian, and you serving the junk to them. That's riding the edge of the cliff. Yeah, I know I'm married, and I, I, I don't go by my old girlfriend's house no more. But uh, to demonstrate that I am changed, I'm going to go by there. What? You fool. You better get that car away from the edge of that cliff and as near the middle of the road as you can. Well, I got to close. So now, there's some things we need to die to. That's what I'm saying. If you live for the Lord, there are things that are going to die in your life because he will kill them. If Jesus comes in, something is going out. <laughs> For Jesus does not coexist with devil men. He said to one man, you cannot obey Christ and mammon. That's in your Bible. All right. Now, the Bible tells us what we need to die to. What shall we say then, Romans 6, 1? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know what he's asking you? Are you going to keep doing the wrong thing so you can say, mercy, Lord? And then he goes on to argue against that. He said, God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? He said, no, don't, don't keep cutting up so you can get, oh, mercy. Have mercy. Forgive me, Lord. Oh, Jesus. You ought to be able to pray one day, thank you, Lord, for giving me victory over that one. You, you didn't hear the rest of it. You didn't hear the rest of it. Thank you, Lord, for giving me victory over that one. Now, help me with this one. Now, you got some life in you. You are showing signs of spiritual life when you think like that. Now, once a man dies, you got to bury him. You know, when you, when the old sins that win the life. Once you die to them, the Bible has scheduled a burial. And you read about it in Colossians, what book did I say? Chapter 2, what chapter? And verses 10 to, uh, uh, did I say 7 to 10? Uh, 10, 11 to 13, that's what I want. It says in verse 12, Colossians 2, Bear it with him, say that everybody. Bear it with him. In baptism. Wherein? Also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, now once you die to liquor drinking, you need to be buried. I mean the liquor drinking you. That's what baptism is. It's burying your sin. That's what baptism is. And the Bible says there ought to be a burial here. And uh, in Romans, what book did I say? The sixth chapter and verses three and four. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death and like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life we go down in baptism and come up walking like somebody else that's what it is it's not a formality Whereas a little child, preacher look at it and say, you love Jesus? Yeah, splash. No, honey, uh-uh. You've got to consciously renounce the old way of life. And if you didn't, before you got baptized, you need to get baptized again. Because all that happened was you went down a dry snuff dipper and you came up a wet one and couldn't wait home, get, wait to get home to stuff your bottom lip with some more brutal. Knowing, knowing there ain't gonna be no spittoons in hip. And the church is the dressing room for glory yeah mm. mm -hmm. you got to die to that cigarette and there's an easy way to die to it every time you get a desire to smoke uh, squirt a little lemon in your mouth or some lime it'll kill it If it don't kill you, it'll kill it. <laughs> 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 
Don't you know there's only one way to break a habit? And that's starve it. Did you hear what I said? There's only one way to break a habit, and that's starve it. Any kind of habit, you name it. I know some men are like, I just can't get that lady out of my mind. Yes, you can. If you stay away from her, she'll, she will go. And, and by the way, burn up a picture. Did you hear what I said? I ain't got much respect for husbands that walk around with their old girlfriend's picture in their pocket. And wife all let him go to bed and burn all of it up. <laughs> Did you hear? <laughs> Did you hear what I said? You can cure any habit. You don't even have to pray to stop a habit. Don't you know there are sinners that are hell-bound that don't drink? Then what in the world is a Christian doing? Standing up in front of a head, oh, oh, I'm so helpless. And a sinner can shake it. There are sinners that quit smoking the moment the Surgeon General of the United States told them that they were getting lung cancer. They quit. They ain't said a word to the Lord. And here you are with the same willpower that they have and the Lord. And you still haven't quit. Don't you know when the United States government published the figures on AIDS, some sinners stopped Running around. And what are you doing? In church. With Jesus. And willpower. And still acting a fool. Is that too strong? No, no. This kind of medicine going to get you to heaven. Because everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Some of y'all folk been playing church because ain't nobody brought you to the line. Honey, out here, I bring you to the line. And this is the line. We've got to face it and quit it. The things you put in your stomach. Oh, I just can't do it out. If the Bible tells you to let it go, you better, you better let it go. And get that sheet of paper that I got on the back seat. I hope they gave you one when you were coming in. You got that blue sheet of paper, and go back and look at it. And even if it breaks your heart, get on the Bible diet. Somebody said to me, you think the Lord keep out of heaven for just a little old pigtail? <laughs> Are you listening to me? Well, he ran Adam and Eve out of, out of the Garden of Eden for what they ate. The Lord said, don't eat it. They ate it. And they were evicted. Now, now wait a minute. How are you going to come up to God at the end holding on to your God, which is your belly? Holding on to what you're chewing on. Well, Lord, I didn't think you'd keep me out of a little uh, uh, pickle pig foot. Uh, just a little old slab of chitlin. Well, I praise God. Heaven ain't made on what you thought. It's not made on what you think. If he put Adam out for eating what was forbidden, how's he going to explain it to Adam letting you in? Talk to me. You ain't going nowhere, honey, till you clean up. You're going to have to get rid of that excess baggage and you might as well get rid of it now so that I can baptize you Sabbath. And wash away all them chitlin. Talk to me. Wash away all of that tobacco. Talk to me. Wash away all that liquor. Talk to me. And wash away all of them no good boyfriends. Talk to me. If you think at age 72, listen to me carefully. 
If you think at age 72, I'm down here playing games. Honey, don't you know I've been sweating away parts of my life every night out here. Stand up here reasoning with you, appealing to you, teaching you. And some of y'all playing games. Well, that's right, but I don't know. In hell, you're going to be floating past. I, I, I let you burn Cleveland, but I just didn't know. I said, uh, farewell, you should have known. Because I sure told you. You'll be standing at the gate, while you're waiting on some of y'all. And you come floating up, well, now, Lord, I, I, yes, she did. I, I, I was down there for solid weeks, Lord, and I read it, and I translated it, and I put it in her, in her hands so she could go home and look at it. It's a little old sheet of paper I gave you tonight that has two things on it. Uh, one, uh, you people give that out. Come on, did you chest that? What, what? Did you give it out? All right, you got two things. Don't you sleep until you study those two things, two sides of that thing. Uh, one that I haven't preached on because it's embarrassing to stand up and preach on it. So I want you to go home and read about it and just read it off. See, I'll preach on what they can't see, but I will not insult you on what they can see. But you go home and read about what you can see and then re read about what you can't see. And then, and then say amen. I said, and say amen. I said, say amen. All right, now let's close. Well, now, so then, go ye therefore, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, baptism is more than water. Baptism is first teach him. And this came from the lips of the Lord himself. Teach him and baptize him. Teach him and baptize him. Teach him and baptize him. And you know, that, that thing is violated nearly every week in America in some churches. They baptize you and they taught you nothing. And taught, taught, haven't taught you how to eat, and taught you how to drink, haven't taught you how to dress. Don't you know? Amen. Amen. You believe in Jesus yet? Splash. <laughs> Got that? Splash. Uh -uh. Jesus said, teach him to observe all of my commandments, then baptize him. And the reason is, if you baptize a man and you haven't taught him, baptism does not change. The water cannot wash away what you still holding on to. Amen. Talk to me. And you can't turn it loose unless you know you ought to turn it loose. And so teach him and baptize him. Well, finally, somebody said, well, look, I've been baptized four times. That lady tell me that. Pastor said, I've baptized four times. You're telling me to go back? I said, well, were you converted the first time? Oh, yes. And were you taught all of God's commandments? Well, no. I said, go back. For the prescription says, teach, baptize. Teach, baptize. Jesus said, Matthew 28, 19, 20. Somebody else said, well, look, uh, I, I was taught. Before I was baptized, you still keep him Sunday? Well, yeah. Still eating all meat? Oh, yeah, I know it's wrong, but still drinking? Yeah, no. Be baptized. Amen. Hit the water. Because you're worse off than the man who didn't know any better. Amen. You knew. And you've been running over God as if he isn't there. You better hit the water early. As a matter of fact, we should baptize you first. I'm afraid for you. Because you know. And then finally, somebody said, well, look, uh, I don't belong to a church where it doesn't require so much. Okay, okay, okay. You want easy way? Yeah, to heaven. 
Yeah, there's no such thing. No such thing. You mean, you mean, you mean, uh huh. That's what I mean. There's no easy way. Enjoy. Well, we have a good time where I am. Mm -hmm. Good. The Bible does not say, blessed are they that have a good time where they are. <laughs> Why, when the choir gets to singing down my place, everybody starts shouting. Uh -huh. The Bible doesn't say, blessed are they that shout. It says, blessed are they, Revelation twenty two fourteen, that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Right, we got to straighten up. Finally, somebody said to me once, said, look, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly what you say right where I am. I said, oh, yeah. I said, okay. Think you can do that? Oh, yes. I, I, I can do everything you teach. And I don't have to move uh, denominationally. I said, mm -hmm. I said, you ever heard of Jesus? Uh-huh. He was in a church 30 years, and he moved. Amen. Said, what? I said, yeah, it's in the Bible. Want to hear it? She didn't want to hear it. I said, but here it comes. This is my last text. Book of Matthew. What book did I say? Uh, the 23rd chapter. What chapter? Verses 38 and 39. I said, you're going to beat Jesus. When Jesus found out they weren't going to follow him, he took off and started a church. Is that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Let's read about him taking off. In 23 Matthew 38, 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. But he would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And verse 1 of chapter 24, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. That's why he grew up in that church. Finally gave up the church that he grew up in. And said, I'm leaving you. Your house is left. Now to prove that's true, listen, to, the disciples didn't want to go. So listen to what they said. Uh, and when Jesus went out and departed from the temple, his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. I didn't want to show him. He grew up around there. But see, the point is, they didn't want to go. You know, it was, please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. You know? Oh, that's hard to change, you know? Uh, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? For verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, but it's all coming down. He not only left that, but he condemned the building. Now, why did he do it? Because he had tried to, to get them to come a little further than their traditional teachings would lead them. But they were creed-bound and hide-bound and muscle-bound and great-grandmama-bound and grandmama-bound and mama bound and, and my mama made me promise on her deathbed that I, I never would you know, all of that stuff and none of it will be worth a sack of popcorn when you stand before the piercing eyes of the judge of the universe who told you to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy who told you to watch what you put into your body? Who told you to watch what you hang on your body? And you ain't read it, and you ain't heard it. Where 
way you are. And it's all in the New Testament. But the problem is, most Christians ain't living in no testament. They're into the newspaper and the dictionary. A Negro right here in Birmingham came running up to me. Rev said, said, Webster says that Sunday is the Lord's day. I said, "Mm mm-hmm. Mark said the Sabbath is the Lord's day. You follow Webster, I follow Mark. And I dare you to tell me, we're going to wind up in the same heaven. And so this coming Sabbath, we're going to baptize in this room. And there'll be some people standing along at these entrances with some little brown bags. If you happen to be a lady, take one. Go home before you sleep tonight. Run for your lives. You put a dress in there. Doesn't have to be beautiful, modern, because it's going in the water. Put an extra dress in there, a sheet, and a towel, and anything else you want to put on so as not to be embarrassed in the water. You put it in there, write your name on it, Friday night when you come bring it here, or Sabbath morning, bring it on out here, because that's when you're really going to need it. If you're a man, take a shirt and a pair of pants and put it in a, one of those brown bags. Snatch it, they'll be there with it, and if they are not with it, let me know so that I can fire them and put somebody back there that'll hold those bags up. Understand that? I want somebody here because some of y'all go out that door. I want somebody over there because somebody goes out that door. And I want somebody over there, over there, over there, and over there. And they're going to be standing there with those bags. They're not going to annoy you. They're just be standing there with them. And you just snatch one and put it under your arm and take it home and get on your knees and commit yourself totally and completely to the will of God and get up in there and fill that bag up and say I can't wait till Friday night when I bring it out there or Sabbath morning when I bring it out there and get in it and oh Lord God change my life I've been a Christian a long time but there's so much I didn't know Lead me, guide me along the way because I'm going to make Jesus my choice. Decided 
you still. Have faith in God and do his blessed will. Have faith in God, his holy word fulfill. Have faith, dear friend, in God. No meeting tomorrow night, but Friday night, bed too short, cover too narrow. Sabbath morning, I want Jesus to walk with me, baptism to follow immediately. And until we meet again, God be in us to sustain us, above us to shelter us, beneath us to uphold us, before us to guide us, and behind us to protect us now, henceforth and forever, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good night. God bless. Sing it, brother. The road is rough. And the going gets tough. And all the hills are hard to climb. You know I started out such a long time ago. There is no doubt. In my mind, I decided to make Jesus my joy.